Hi, I love horror. Do you? Welcome to Love Horror Podcast Episode 12. (gasps) Every other week previously, I'd been looking at trivia from Friday the 13th movies, parts 1 to 10, Jason X. This time I'm going to look at the last two, the spin-off, Freddy vs. Jason from 2003, and Friday the 13th, the 2009 reboot. Okay, let's get started with Freddy vs. Jason from 2003. This was the last movie to do with Freddy that featured the original actor Robert England. The next movie, of course, to use that character would be the reboot in 2010, which would feature a new actor. The last four movies of Friday the 13th had featured Kane Hodder, the fan favourite, as Jason. This one would have a replacement as well. According to Robert England, who played Freddy, the makeup was so thick he couldn't really judge how hot the fires were that he was near when he was filming. When he got to get his makeup removed, he literally found it was bound to his face. Ken, the guy who was the new Jason in this movie, had to undergo some dental work during the filming, but it had taken so much time to it would have taken so much time to remove the makeup and reapply it. Same with the costume. He went to the dentist in full costume apart from the hockey mask, and some people thought he was an escaped psychopath and called the police. Standing six feet five inches, Ken is the tallest actor to play Jason Voorhees to date. Betsy Palmer, who played Jason's mother in the original Friday the 13th from 1980 was asked to reprise her role as Pamela Voorhees in a cameo role but she felt a cameo role like this was beneath her and too small a part. The popular director Peter Jackson was asked to direct this movie. Chronologically the film is set after the events of Freddy's Dead The Final Nightmare 1991. Jason Goes to Hell The Final Friday 1993 but sometime, of course, before Jason 10 or Jason X, which is set in in space in the future. That movie, Jason X, was released before Freddy vs. Jason, though, because Freddy vs. Jason was in development hell for so long. Originally, they had planned on releasing Freddy vs. Jason first, before Jason X, but because of all the delays, they actually put Jason X on the shelf to await release later, but because it kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed, Freddy vs. Jason, they actually did end up releasing Jason X first. Kane Hodder, who, as I mentioned previously, tends to be the fan favourite as Jason, did offer to reprise his role for Freddy vs. Jason, but he was turned down for the part because some people at New Line Cinema felt that Jason needed to be taller and larger so they could create this kind of David and Goliath, this sort of imagery between Freddy and Jason. New Line felt that Hodder was too short and balky. Freddy's How Sweet Dark Meat line is a variation on the line How Sweet Fresh Meat, which was featured in A Nightmare on Elm Street, Part 4, The Dream Master, in 1988. Western Hills is Freddy's birthplace and was featured in A Nightmare on Elm Street, Part 3, Dream Warriors, 1987. The actor who played Freeberg in the movie was a teenage partygoer in Halloween Resurrection in 2002, making him the first person to appear in a Freddy, a Jason and a Michael Myers film. While filming the scene in the cabin where Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees finally confront each other properly, the actor Ken, Jason, actually caught on fire. A stuntman for over 20 years, he remained calm while stagehands rushed in with a fire extinguisher to put him out. A sequel was planned to Freddy vs. Jason, but it never happened. However, there was a six-issue comic series in late 2007 and early 2008. This also added the character Ash Williams from the Evil Dead movies to the mix, which is quite interesting. Pity it didn't happen as a movie. When Jason is impaled on his own machete, Freddy uses some iron plates to push the machete in deeper. The last three plates that fly through the air form the New Line Cinema logo, which is something I didn't know till recently. In the first interview concerning this film, the actor who played Jason, Ken, did the whole video interview in Jason's costume, wearing the makeup, the clothes, mask, everything, in order to make the viewers more confident in him and to show his loyalty to the character. 
Rob Zombie was offered to direct, but turned it down to work on his pet project, The House of 1000 Corpses, from 2003, which is perhaps one of Rob Zombie's most well-known movies. He made it himself. It's not another franchise, as in the case of Halloween, which he would go on to make the reboot of. In 2007, I believe it was, he would go on to do the remake, the reboot of Halloween, and its sequel, Halloween 2. In fact, his remake of Halloween was actually pretty good. I was quite surprised, although the sequel he completely destroyed. He completely took everything that made Halloween good and destroyed it. But anyway, that's another story. So I'm not sure. I'm not really sure though how well he would have done Freddy vs Jason. But then again, since he did the first of the two Halloween movies, okay, maybe Freddy vs Jason would have been all right as well. In the beginning of the movie, as Freddy Krueger gives his monologue, there are clips from A Nightmare on Elm Street, the original in 1984, A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, 4, 5, and The Final Nightmare. The goat seen in Blake's early nightmare sequence is a reference to Tina's nightmare involving a goat in the original A Nightmare on Elm Street, 84. The kids go to Western Hills to look for the experimental drug, Hypnosil. Hypnosil was shown to be the drug that was taken by Nancy to suppress her dreams in A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3, Dream Warriors. Nancy was also the one who suggested that they prescribe Hypnosil to the patients. The body count in this, Freddy vs. Jason, is 24. New Line Cinema originally attempted to make this movie several times in the late 80s when they tried to team up originally with Paramount Pictures, but that never happened because they never came to an agreement. Now, if you don't already know, the Friday 13th franchise was made by Paramount Pictures, or at least published by them, from the very original up until part 8. Jason Takes Manhattan was the last movie made of Friday the 13th by Paramount. They then sold the rights to New Line Cinema, who then went on to make part 9, part 10, and Freddy vs. Jason. The $25 million budget of this movie is the highest in the Friday the 13th franchise, though we ha- must bear in mind that this is two franchises put together, so in a way I think you would expect to have a higher budget because you are making basically kind of two movies at once. There's two franchises involved, so you probably would put more money into it. The scene which featured Jason's bed kill, where he kills the guy in the bed then folds the bed in half, was originally rejected by New Line Studios. The executives didn't want that in it, but the writers fought quite hard to get it in. They then finally got it in, And the scene was filmed, and it turns out that this scene got the biggest reaction from the test audiences. The actor of Jason in this movie went to New Line Cinema for an interview for the stunt coordinating job. The producers then noticed his looks, his physical size, and asked him to audition actually for the entire role of Jason. The bag placed over Jason's head in the Crystal Lake Nightmare is a reference to the bag that Jason wore in Friday the 13th Part 2, 1981, which was the first of the Friday the 13th to feature Jason. Part 1, it was actually his mother doing it. Part 2, it's the first with Jason in it, but he hadn't been given his hockey mask yet. He had a bag over his head with a hole cut out for his eye, a little bit like the Elephant Man. You'd not see his hockey mask till Part 3. 17 scripts were submitted, which eventually turned into one script. The producers decided for some time to go ahead with this script, but changed their mind as they could not agree with the ideas proposed. Eventually, some new script writers came in and created their own script, which the producers felt were much more closer to the Freddy and Jason backstories. Much of the earlier scripts dealt with various courts that were attempting to resurrect Freddy and Jason to bring them back and fight. Which, I don't know if you, the listeners, like or not that idea, but if you watch recent horror movies from the last 10 years or so, that's been happening more and more in various franchises, especially if they start to run out of ideas. They bring in these uh, court leaders and courts, and it, it it's just a bit boring, to be honest. The first film since The New Blood, uh, Part 7, not to feature Kane Hodder, This was the first Freddy movie not to be filmed in the United States of America and the filmmakers had to search for a new house that could resemble the infamous 
Freddy uh, House on Elm Street, the core letters of the news station in this movie, the core letters of the news station shown on the TV in the hospital are KR, GR, which is quite obviously a reference to Freddy Krueger's name. This is also the name of the radio station that Glenn, played by Johnny Depp, is listening to right before he dies in the original A Nightmare on Elm Street. One early version of the script called for the beginning of the film to take place in medieval times, while another called for the beginning to start out at Camp Crystal Lake, where Jason was getting assorted. Another script was to have the beginning of the film take place on the eve of the millennium. According to the director Ronnie Yu, one of his Hong Kong filmmaking styles he incorporated into the movie was using various camera speeds during the fight sequence in order to get that action impact feel. According to the director as well, the special effects team used 300 gallons of fake blood for the movie. Catherine Isabel, who you might know from things like Ginger Snaps, was quite upset with the director when she learned that by accepting the role, which is something the director had suggested to her, she was actually expected to do a nude shower scene. She refused to do it and so Tammy Morris replaced her as a body double for the scene. And there ended up being uh, some friction between the director and herself for the rest of the shoot. The way Jason looks at his hand after Freddy cuts off his fingers is a nod to the Freddy the 13th, the final chapter, 1984, where Trish stabs him in the hand between his fingers. He stops what he's doing and looks at his hand in the same way. This is number 8 of A Nightmare on Street, but also the 11th, Friday the 13th. Of course, some fans look at this as being a sequel to Nightmare on Elm Street. Other fans look at it as being a sequel to Friday the 13th. Some fans, including myself, look at it as neither a, as a sequel to neither of those, but as more of a spin-off. I personally look at it as being a spin-off rather than a sequel. Ronnie Yu, the director, originally turned down the directing job because the script didn't indicate who was going to be the victor. He only agreed to take the job when he was later told that he could make that decision for himself. Freddy's boiler room in the movie was not a built set. It was actually an old boiler room redressed by the crew. Jason's regeneration at the start of this movie is very similar to Kruger's regeneration in Elm Street Part 4. Filming this movie lasted 53 days, so less than two months to film the whole thing. Although Ken was chosen to play Jason, many reshoots were made in the very late stages of production where he was unavailable to work, so another actor stood in. The director and producers did limit Ken's involvement in his own stunts as much as they could possibly could for legal reasons. The original script, the original final uh, draft, was clocked in at around two and a half hours which of course plenty of movies are two and a half hours, but for this they decided that was too long and they uh, rewrote it to be a more of an acceptable length. The scene where Jason kicks down two different doors at the asylum is a reference to Jason X 2001 where he knocks down multiple doors aboard the Grendel. The screenwriters of this movie were immediately hired by the studio to write the 2009 Friday the 13th reboot after Freddy vs. Jason was completed. As producers have been highly impressed by their knowledge of the series and their work on the script for this movie. So clearly the writers knew the, both of these franchises very well. The filmmakers found it very difficult to give a clear winner in the fight of Freddy vs. Jason because they didn't want to alienate fans of either franchise, which is quite understandable. So what they did was they made it look like Freddy won the battle in the dream. Jason won their second battle, but then at the very end they give an ambiguous ending implying that both could have survived. I know some fans aren't too keen on the ending, but I think they did a good job because, like I just said, it is hard to please everyone. The lake used for Camp Crystal Lake was also being used to film the final scenes for X2 X-Men United at the same time as they were filming Freddy vs. Jason, and the two casts even stayed at the same hotel. Robert England was actually excited at the casting of Catherine in Freddy vs. Jason as he was apparently a big fan of her in the court film Ginger Snaps, which if you haven't seen it is a quite a popular werewolf movie. I'm not a big fan of werewolf movies myself, but that is a decent movie. If you haven't seen it already, I recommend you check it out. Okay, let's look at Friday the 13th trivia. And when I say Friday the 13th, I mean the reboot from 2009. 
including the 2009 remake, Jason has killed 167 people throughout the franchise. The producer, Michael Bay, walked out of the premiere for Friday the 13th, stating that it featured too much sex. Well, yes, it features more sex than some of the previous installments, but then again, I don't didn't think it featured too much. I didn't think it was too over the top. Yes, I think there was probably more nudity than in most of the Friday the 13th, but still, I, you know, I thought it was an acceptable level, apart from maybe the one scene in the tent was a bit over the top, perhaps. Adrian King, the star of the original 1980 movie, uh, she was a leading lady in that. She was approached originally by the producers to do a cameo uh, when they're in, in the pre production stages, but a few days later, the producers called her back and told her that they didn't want anyone from the original movies to appear in the remake at all, which is a pity because I like, I like when they do remakes and things like that and they feature some of the old actors. I, I like that, and I'm not sure why they decided to go completely against it in the end. Clay and Whitney's last name, their surname is Miller. This is a reference to Victor Miller, who wrote the original Friday the 13th. Interestingly, this features Jason, Jason Voorhees, even though he was not in the original, because they clearly went with the reboot route instead of the remake route. And I understand that in this case, because as good as the original was, people want Jason now. So they, I think they went down the right route with this. And this Jason actually not just has his hockey mask, but he starts off, which is interesting, he starts off with his burlap sack, which is from the second one before he got his hockey mask. So he starts off in the first part of the movie with his original mask, then he finds his hockey mask like he did in part three, and then wears that from there then on, which I think is a very good idea. With $42.2 million, this had the highest opening weekend of any horror remake beating the former record which was held by the remake of The Grudge in 2004. Tommy Jarvis, who if you've seen the previous Friday the 13th, you'll know his name instantly, a character that appeared in the final chapter 1984, A New Beginning 85, and Jason Lives, Friday the 13th, Part 6, 1986, was at one point confirmed by the producers of Platinum Dunes who made this remake to be returning as Jason's nemesis which I think is a really, really good idea. So instead of having the new character that they introduced in this one, they could start off with the idea of Tommy, who's well-known to fans, even though I'm sure it wouldn't have been the same actor, of course. And in fact, there were several different actors, actually three different actors played him in the past. I think having him as a nemesis, which people remember as his nemesis previously, I think it was been a clever idea. And again, not sure why they dropped that idea. It seems like they had a couple of ideas in the early stages, which were really good, and then dropped them later on. The film was released on Friday the 13th, 2009. This is the first time that Paramount Pictures had any associations with, this, with the Friday the 13th brand since 1989, which also makes it the first film in the series where both New Line Cinema and Platinum Pictures were involved together in the making of the movie. The title card of the movie doesn't appear until the end of the opening segment, nearly 25 minutes into the movie. You have a huge, huge opening segment in this one, and the title card saying Friday the 13th doesn't appear for about 25 minutes, which is a long time. In fact, I think it... You, I don't see any information here right now, but I think I remember hearing that that is one of the longest of any movie. It is considered a remake of Friday the 13th, but I consider it more reboot because it isn't the same storyline. It doesn't involve the mother going on a revenge rampage. It features Jason, and it also combines elements as a story from Parts 2, 1981, Part 3, 1982, along with several references to A New Beginning in 1985 and Jason Lives 1986 and even Jason 10, Jason X 2001. So I think officially it's called a remake. Personally, I would call it a reboot. Derek Mears is the eighth actor to play adult Jason Voorhees. The film was shot mostly in Texas. Uh, the original Friday 13th in 1980 was filmed in New Jersey. Platinum Dunes decided to use Marcus Nis Nisbell. Nisbell, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but anyway, he was a director of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake in 2003. And 
some people might think it's a good idea because it's a similar sort of movie. It's a slasher. But unfortunately, the, this movie, even though I like this reboot, it came across as being almost another Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It seemed like the makers had the uh, had the character of Leatherface in their head too much because, yes, Jason Voorhees ran sometimes in the Friday 13th, but he became known later on as being slow and menacing. This one, he runs, which, yeah, that doesn't mean necessarily he's Leatherface, but there are two problems I really have with this movie. One, he has this underground network of almost mines or caves, tunnels, uh, which reminds me of the tunnels that sometimes was seen in the night in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies with Leatherface. And also he takes a prisoner. He takes a woman hostage because he believes she looks like his mother young. However, Jason Voorhees never took any prisoners. This is more something that Leatherface would do. A sequel was announced originally after the release of this movie by Platinum Dunes. However, a sequel never happened and it never happened then it was cancelled then it wasn't cancelled then it was cancelled again and very much it's in development hell at the time of making this podcast we are now going into the 4th of may 2015 and it still hasn't started filming yet even though i believe it's not cancelled now i believe they have re-announced it It, at this time it still hasn't happened so i'll believe it when i see it one part of the cooperation between New Line and Paramount with this one is that New Line, or rather Warner Brothers through the New Line label, distributed this movie in North America, whereas Paramount distributed it in other territories. Jared, and I'm not even going to even start to try to pronounce his surname, I'm terrible pronouncing names, and his Supernatural co-star Jensen at Eccles, both were on hiatus from their TV popular TV series, Supernatural, which at the time of making this podcast has had 10 seasons. At the same time, they did both did remakes of AD slasher movies. Jared, of course, was the main lead role in this Friday 13th reboot, and Jensen did a reboot of My Bloody Valentine. The opening sequence, the first opening sort of scenes, take place on June the 13th, 1980, then the rest of the movie takes place in the year that this came out, 2009. The body count in this movie is 14, which is relatively low for a Friday the 13th, and 13 of those were killed by Jason. So 14 body count is reasonably low for the franchise. So that wraps up for this time. This week we have looked at the final Friday the 13th trivias from the spin-off, Freddy vs. Jason, and the remake in 2009. So that is it for Friday 13th Trivia. As a reminder, you can find and subscribe to this podcast in the iTunes podcast directory using the iTunes software on your Mac or PC. If you have any suggestions for the next episode or just this podcast in general, then you can email me, as always, at lovehorrorpodcast at yahoo.co.uk. That's lovehorrorpodcast, all in word, without the question mark, at yahoo.co.uk. Thanks for tuning in.